Hello and welcome to another submarine chat. This one is going to be about Russian submarine capabilities current and in the future. Like my other chats, it's unscripted, but I prepared some materials. Actually, these materials were for a talk I gave recently, and I thought I should share it on YouTube as well. So I'm recording a, a video. I've added a few slides and that, so uh, trying to give a, a more complete picture than the talk, less focused, but uh, hopefully it's interesting. Should also say, get out of the way, there's a lot of emotion around Russian forces at the moment and a lot of strong opinions. This is not one of those videos. This is a uh, defense analysis. I'm just gonna say it as it is um, and try to dispel any myths along the way. Okay, so let's get on with it. Firstly, get this out of the way. The Russian armed forces that we've seen in Ukraine, the submarine forces, not the army, it's not the air force and so on. It's perceived very differently and for good reason. So we've seen lots of shortcomings of Russian forces. I think we've got to be careful not to uh, let emotion uh, cloud our judgment on, on the effectiveness of different systems. And we certainly are only seeing part of the picture in the open source intelligence that's being generated, but it's still very different. The submarine part of the Russian armed forces is the best funded, the best equipped, and the, in some respects, the most formidable. It is a, uh, a real frontline force, and it's respected um, as, as an adversary by top peer um, navies. It is, there's no doubt the submarine service of the Russian Navy is one of the powerful in the world. I don't want to get into, you know, whether it's better or worse than, uh, you know, the Royal Navy or the US Navy and so on, it's up there. So the submarines themselves are much better than some of the stories you hear, you know, you're hearing about they're noisy compared to Western ones or they're always sinking or whatever. There's, there's a lot of um, either outdated or emotional uh, reactions there. Also, and this is why I think, you know, we don't view the submarine service the same as the army for a, a few reasons. One is that the submarine service, the submariners themselves tend to be older and more experienced than Western submariners. They tend to spend longer on the same class of submarine as well. Um, there's other differences in the structure. They tend to have more officers and things like that. That's more a, a structural thing. But as you can see, and this is just a, a video of a, a new submarine, the average submariner in, in Russia is probably a few years older and a few years longer on the boat. If we step back, the Russian submarine service has been through quite a roller coaster. Um, at the end of the 1980s, at the end of the Cold War, the submarines that were being built, the Akuda class, Oscar IIs and Typhoon, some famous submarines there, were really top rate. Um, Russia had largely solved its noise problem with submarines. Um, these submarines are very formidable. And there's some technologies that they were definitely ahead of the West on or, or on par. But the end of the Cold War, as with most countries, it resulted in what you could call a peace dividend. Obviously, it was devastating the transition from the Soviet Navy to the Russian Navy massive downsizing, cancellation of new projects, cancellation of build of some submarines that were already under construction and very low activity. The submariners got you know, very few at sea days and so on. Funding was a problem. What's worth knowing though, is that a lot of submarines in service today were built at this time. They were ones that were being built at the end of the Cold War and they were completed. So it wasn't that all building stopped. Um, so some of the submarines are not that old, but in design terms, you know, a lot of submarines today are still of that generation of the 80s. The 2000s remained very low, but in the 2010s, you start to get a pretty major rearmament with new types of submarine, particularly call out the Yasin and Bore classes. And we'll talk a tiny bit more about them. So these submarines are much more um, 
stealthier than previous versions and a more uh, combat effective and, and very serious threat. Also, the at-sea days and things like that started to go up. The Russian submarines are being operated with a high level of competence, both in the crews and in the command. So there's considered a pretty real threat. And we see that with submarines, nuclear submarines operating in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean um, facing NATO forces in a way that is characteristic of the old previous Cold War. Okay, talking about different types of submarines, a, almost a special category of submarine in, in navies is the SSBN. That's a nuclear powered ballistic missile submarine. They perform the nuclear deterrent. Russia maintains two fleets of these, one in the Pacific, one in the Northern fleet in the Arctic. And they can operate in bastions and Arctic bastions particularly. So they don't range very far from base. They go to deep or, or secure water where they're perceived to be more survivable. It gives, um, Russia, in some respects, a geographical advantage, although we broadly talk about the disadvantages of, of the geography for Russia's Navy. Um, when it comes to the SSBNs, they actually have uh, these bastions, which are quite good. Now, the current ones being built, there's still a few Delta Fours and stuff in service. You know, if you're into submarines, you'll know what I'm talking about there. But the latest ones, the Bore class, are newer as submarines than the equivalent ones in the West at the moment. Um, the Ohio class is a 1970s design. The Vanguard class is an 80s design built in the 90s and so on. The, these, or the latest Bore A's are essentially new build, new designs in the last 10 years. Now, of course, this will shift again as the Columbia and Dreadnoughts come in service in the West. Um, but at the moment, bear in mind that these submarines are actually newer than the Western equivalents. Another submarine that's very new is the cruise missile submarines, the Yasin class or Severodinsk class. And there's uh, a couple of subclasses here. These are very highly regarded by Western um, sources. They're, they're much more stealthy than the previous generations. Can't, you know, we don't know whether they're stealthier or, or not than Western ones. That almost doesn't matter. It's not a competition of who is the most stealthy. These are stealthy enough to be uh, very hard to fight, and that's dusky. They're armed with anti-ship and land attack cruise missiles, and they're being built in some numbers, at least eight of these, of this particular model. Looking a bit more, this is a cutaway, it's available on my website, obviously view all the numbers and things. The missiles are what I want to point out. These submarines can act as attack submarines, but they carry more cruise missiles than equivalent Western types, only the Ohio conversions carry more. Um, and those Ohio conversions up until now haven't had anti-ship capability. It's a very different prospect. So they're much more heavily armed than, say, the Virginia class, the SG class, and so on. They're different category submarine. And that's why we call them SSGNs and not just SSNs, the G for guided missile. Also, look at the front. You've got a really big conformal sonar array, very modern. One of the weapons they carry is the caliber. This is essentially Russia's answer to the Tomahawk missile. It comes in two versions. One is a land attack missile, which really is a lot like a Tomahawk, and one is an anti-ship missile, which has a supersonic final stage. And they're already carried by the latest cruise missile submarines, but also by the conventional submarines. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a moment. So they're widely available. They've been firing them into Ukraine, as the photos on the right show, a lot of them are being fired from service vessels, from warships. Probably um, some of them are being fired from submarines as well. We, we can't prove that at the moment based on open source unless Russia declares it, but we know that those submarines are armed with them. We know that those submarines were carrying them, and this is significant. Okay, what is more interesting though, I think, is that as submarines come in for refit, older attack submarines and, and cruise missile submarines, the Oscars and so on, they are likely to be upgraded to carry uh, caliber cruise missiles. And so the number of submarines in Russian service with, with, with cruise missiles on will increase significantly. And in a cooler class submarine, you know, a finger in the air, but I'd guess they can carry 10 quite comfortably as a mix within their very large torpedo loadout. 
have 40 weapons. The next missile um, is the Zircon missile. Um, there are other types, Sonics and so on, but the Zircon is where it's at. This is a hypersonic anti-ship missile. Russia is ahead of the West in terms of adopting and uh, hypersonic missiles. The Zircon is not yet in service with submarines, although you know some media sort of assume it is and certainly give that impression. I don't think it's being carried operationally by submarines yet, but it will be, and particularly cruise missile submarines. One shortcoming of Zircon is, as far as we can tell, it is only in vertical launch tubes, which will limit which submarines can carry it. But I think the Oscar class, when they go through modernization to AM standard, they can be equipped with it as well. Um, so we we'll probably have eight to 10 submarines with Zircon by the end of the, the decade. The conventional submarines are interesting because this is where Russia is different from leading Western navies. Uh, you know, US, UK, France have stopped having conventional submarines for different reasons, but to a large part for cost reasons. Um, in Russia, they still have them. These are armed with caliber cruise missiles, all the latest ones, that is. Um, on some of them, they have very impressive sonar. You can see it at the front of this ladder class. It's that sort of different shaded area at the front of the submarine, much larger than the sonar arrays on other conventional submarines. And they're deployed in all the fleets except the Caspian, which is a sort of a flotilla, and particularly on a semi-permanent basis in the Mediterranean. So these are in the Black Sea. These are the ones that would be launching cruise missiles. They'd be Kilo class submarines in that case. Um, but it's, uh, it's a significant difference. It's a bit of a mixed story though. Um, the the non-nuclear submarines have benefited, but also been held back by exports. This is my view. Even during the low point, um, Russia was able to export non-nuclear submarines, something that the West, uh, well, certainly the US and UK cannot do. Um, so the good news for them was they were able to keep their production lines open and people skilled and so on. And the investment in certain modifications for export customers essentially paid for the R&D, which was then translated into Russian submarines as well. So they're still building them. On the other hand, the Kilo class submarine, which has been so successful, is now quite dated. And so I, I feel it's held them back a little bit as well. Overall investment has been much lower than on nuclear submarines. The good news is these submarines are cheaper. They, are, they haven't attempted to push the boundaries as much. And particularly the latest versions have suffered from very slow development, mainly out of funding and technical issues. In particular, they doesn't have air independent power AIP. This is something that we were expecting them and Russia has a strong history of AIP in the past, but their current submarines don't have it and it puts them behind equivalent designs in, in other countries, Germany, Sweden, and so on, China even. There is talk of collaboration with China on non-nuclear submarines, probably the Kalina class, which is a future design. It's not really clear if that really, what will come of that, um, but it's definitely talks. And it's also not clear to me who the, you know, who the better party is there. You'd assume that Russia is the experienced submarine builder. By now, with all the issues that Russian non-nuclear submarines have been having, China is actually um, probably got more to offer, lithium batteries and so on. Okay. Another area where Russia is very different from the West is in seabed warfare, special mission submarines, spy subs, essentially. The West, in particular US, has some capability, but no one does it anything like the Russians. They have the largest fleet of these sorts of submarines in the world, and those submarines are among the largest in the world. Um, so a huge amount of money. We're talking about capabilities like tapping or, or interrupting underwater cables, internet cables, things like that, but also everything else that goes on in the seabed. Why is Russia so invested in this? Well, we can guess that's maybe a topic for another video. Another standout capability developing is the Poseidon weapon. This is an intercontinental nuclear arm, nuclear powered autonomous torpedo. I'd say it is a torpedo, not a drone, although it has some characteristics of a drone. Note the person on it though, that is a massive torpedo. That's added no comparison to anything in the West or any other country. It's got both a tactical and nuclear and strategic nuclear role. So you can use it against 
uh, aircraft carriers, for example, and have a high value target, or you can use it against coastal cities. There's still some question marks in my mind, at least, about how viable it is in all these scenarios, particularly tactical, but that's definitely how it's presented by the Russians. There is a lot of misunderstanding and misinformation about that. There's a lot of nonsense on the internet. Um, beware of exaggerated claims and, and beware of people who think they know or tell you that they know why the Russians built it. We don't, it's only in the West. Um, but just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not real, it is. And we also, for all the bad sort of data about it, it almost certainly goes too deep and too fast to be intercepted effectively by current weapons. We'll need to develop new weapons to counter this. And there'll be at least four host submarines planned, at least by current uh, plans. There's one already in the water, one is about to be launched you know, anytime now, and two more are known. So you know, it's, it's, it's real. The current attack submarines are mostly 1980s and 70s designs. Some of them were built in the 90s, as I said, but they're getting old. They're going to be replaced by new types of nuclear pad attack submarine. Indications are that, that just as in the West, there'll be a blurring of between the attack submarine and cruise missile submarine. They will almost certainly have vertical launch tubes or hypersonic missiles, for example. And it's likely to come around the 2030s, 2040s. Timelines are very unreliable, the ones that have been published. You know, things always take longer. But that's more or less in line with the latest Western SSN designs, you know, SSNR and so on. So something to watch out for. Going back to where we started, the, the timeline. So if you remember, things got really bad for the Russian Navy in the 1990s, 2000s, and they're now picking out. The trajectory has been upwards. Now, obviously, the war in Ukraine builds a lot of uncertainty into the future of Russia as a power, Russia as an economy, and so on. So I don't want to predict what impact that will ultimately have on the Russian Navy, and in particular the submarine service, that there are different scenarios we can, we can uh, explore, but uh, yeah, we couldn't really say we should get any confidence. What we can say, though, is the future has hypersonic missiles in it, probably before the West. It has quality as well as quantity. We shouldn't think of Russian submarines as low quality. Um, and they can build them in greater quantity, or they already have them in greater quantity, certainly than the Royal Navy, for example. Um, and there's new weapon systems, including Poseidon, which is a completely new category of weapon. Okay, that's everything I wanted to share. Hopefully this gives you a good overview of the Russian Navy submarine service, you know, where it is, where it's going. As I said, it was unscripted. I always say that. Um, but just to let you know that I might have missed a few things or not said uh, everything that I wanted to say. But anyway, I think it was useful. So thank you. Please like, please share, please subscribe and so on. Thanks again.